Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Sandy, my name is oh. Amanda. I'm a physical therapist. I just have a question for you in regards to um, this type, this type of case here, case two versus. Um, I have a say. You have a patient with a UTI who's been in the hospital, and they don't go to rehab. They come straight home. A UTI yep. with a patient with a non-cognitive impairment. About two years ago, CMS deemed that that patient with just a transient loss of a transient onset of weakness was not covered for physical therapy due to the fact that it was transient. That weakness should improve, you know, just over time. The patient with the UTI with a cognitive impairment, however, would qualify for therapy because they're not going to know how to gauge that. That fall risk is increased on someone who has limited awareness that anything has changed. Have you seen any of that going on in the world of CMS? Well, I haven't. We haven't seen a lot of this because now's the time. So you said that was two years ago that they yeah, determined? It came, yeah, it came out about two years ago. There was a case that it was a transient loss of weakness, and it was due to a pneumonia case. Um, we talked about it during our rehab case conferences. It was a case so I think that Arthur can help us with, I believe that what I heard in one of our conferences the other day, Arthur, is now we're going back two years and resubmitting the stuff, given, given the Jimmo case. Is that correct, Arthur? Yeah, there actually is this very long window, because technically this case, the standards that they, they're enunciating here were in effect as of the time the case was filed, if my recollection, that was like 2011. 2011. That's right. So you can actually, re, you could actually resubmit that case if if that person had been on, had, had, if you had delivered the services and those services had been on private pay, mm -hmm. that person could still submit now for a Medicare reimbursement. And I would submit that, resubmit that case with a, excuse me, with a cover letter that discusses the fact that this was a maintenance case. Mm -hmm. And given Jimmo, would it be, re I would send, make sure you send a cover letter yeah. and, and talk about resubmitting it with an eye on the Jimmo case. And, yes. and uh, I'd be very interested to know if they'll turn that around for you. Well, a lot of what was happening in the, in the, as you call it, the boroughs area was that a lot of hospitals were not referring individuals to home care for, you know, for, let's say for a physical therapy only case or a PTOT case, primarily because it was a transient episode. If there was no other underlying, I mean, now granted the majority of our patients have, as you've seen in this, eight underlying diagnoses. But, for those that it's basically straightforward, those patients weren't even being referred to home care because of that transient issue. Exactly, exactly. And again, I think that, and, and one of the other things that Arthur was talking about is, is that these cases may not make, the transient cases, you're not going to get a really great case weight, are you? I mean, yeah. you're not going to get a great case weight, but on your MS patients and your Alzheimer's patients, those are neurological diagnoses. And those patients do have an awful lot of need for physical therapy and whatnot. So those cases, you probably are. But the cases that you're talking about, you're not going to get huge money on those cases. But the bottom line is, should you be taking care of that client? Is it in the client's best interest? Should you be taking care of the client? You absolutely should. And it'll balance out with your other clients. And the hospitals and the rehabs need to now be educated on this. And, and our, our question is going to be, how do we do that? How do we make sure that that now they do refer to you because, as you said, they stopped referring to you because, you know, probably a lot of home care agencies were telling them they couldn't take them. San Sandy, in, in, in cases now where you do have a, a dementia resu resulting from Alzheimer's or another diagnosed disease, is there, is there a case that almost inevitably that the, that the nurse is going to be needing to go back or that somebody's going to be needing to go back during that entire 60-day period and maybe beyond just in order to keep assessing whether or not the, the, the skills have been learned and, have, and haven't been forgotten yet, given the fact that if the skills get forgotten, then you're, you're, at, you're at risk of returning them to the hospital. Absolutely. And don't, don't forget, especially in these dementia cases and the Alzheimer's cases, the family, if the family's taking care of them or, or whoever the caregiver is, 
caregiver burnout is amazing. I mean, we go in and we tell our families all the time, the caregivers are going to drop first because she's going to get excellent care, but the caregivers are getting no sleep because we know a lot of the cognitively impaired patients, they'll sleep for 20 minutes off and on all day and all night, and you can't sustain that as the caregiver, but they can because they're not running around doing the laundry, making all of the meals, doing all of the shopping, keeping the house up, organizing the schedule. I mean, they're not doing all of those things. God forbid also going to work all day. So the, the caregivers are the ones that the skilled nurse needs to be paying attention to as well and make sure that we, we actually peeked in the window yesterday of a, a client. We were trying to go and see her. It's a 92-year-old client with very advanced Alzheimer's. Sandy, but you peeked through the window? That's a, is that a, is that a skilled we, we service? <laughs> we did. Well, we were knocking on the door and nobody was answering. So we peeked in the window, and the, the 92-year-old woman was sitting beautifully dressed, beautifully coiffed, in her chair in her living room, and we noticed something odd. She was trying to move her hands. They had taken gauze rolls and tied her hands to her chair. Aww. And what we found is that the caregiver, who's a 24-hour live-in caregiver, the daughter and the son work all day. She, she needed to use the bathroom. And the woman was having a few moments where she was, you know, kind of agitated. She was, the caregiver was afraid she was going to get up so, and, and hurt herself and fall. So she used a gauze roll and she tied her hands to the chair to keep her in the chair for a few minutes while she went to the bathroom. When we got there, the caregiver was in absolute hysterics, crying, sobbing, unconsolable because she got caught doing it. But it, this is a wonderfully caring woman who does amazing things for this lady, but she just needed to use the bathroom. And she couldn't figure out how to keep her safe. Nurses, we all need to be in there, all of us, the skill team, need to be in there to help these people figure these things out. I'm not going to go through the third slide. It's a Parkinson's case, but you get it now, right? I don't want to take up any more of your time. You get it now, is that don't give away your skill. Document your skill. Uh, the people at CMS understand that your skills, they're laughing at us because we're saying that we can give away the home exercise program to a home health aide permanently or to a daughter permanently, and we don't ever need to know if it's working or if they're doing it right. That's not true. We do need to know. Can I ask a question? My name is Heather. I'm also a physical therapist. Um, it, we have a lot of clients who are in assisted living facilities or... Um, even in, in rest homes or even in their own home, and we know they're a high fall risk. We know that they are repetitive UTIs. We know that they're not going to follow through on that home exercise program because of caregiver burnout or they just run out of time or those types of things. I understand the skill of a physical therapist to go in, but if you're, so on, in one hand you have a situation where you can continually go in and reassess the home exercise program and say they're not going to do it. Um, and you can kind of try to figure out other ways to care for that patient and prevent falls. Um, so there's that case, but you also have the case where it's a recurrent UTI for nursing and that's going to contribute to their falls. How do you justify to CMS that your skill is necessary in that case? How come, well, first of all, you, can, you said in, in the scenario several times, repetitive. So, again, if you can show that every couple of months this woman is having a fall, even if she's not being injured, she's falling, or every couple of months she's getting a UTI, first of all, are you clearing a 60-day plan of care before that's happening again? And if you're not, there's your justification, even, even without GMO, there's your justification. But, again, if, if she's falling all of the time, um, or even getting urinary tract infections. How come there's not a home health aide in there three times a week making sure that her hygiene is okay and finding out what the, what's the problem with the toileting? How come, um, obviously, she's, she, something's going on while she's getting repeat UTIs. What's going on in the house? What is it that she's trying to do when she's falling? Is she using her device appropriately? Um, how come there's not a home health aide in there um, that you're communicating with well, that is your eyes and ears on the ground and you're there every couple of weeks to see um, if things are still going well. Now there are, there, we have several instances where maybe the home health aide was there and the client refused them. They didn't want them anymore. There's instances, I can think of a very clear example where the resident is 
refusing a service plan from the home, from the ALF. Um, family is in agreement with that because they don't want to upset their mother. She, I went in and found Depends shredded all over the floor and found out that she was using toilet tissue to uh, be absorbent because cool. it was less money than using the three Depends or the, the poise pads or whatever else. So I mean, and we've done education, we've done, you know, what we can, but it's a recurrent UTI, therefore, we don't clear the 60-day window, or we do clear the 60-day window, and we're still not being able to resolve that issue. It's a maintenance thing in that we're trying to prevent it from happening, but yep. in this particular case, she was not all that open to suggestion either. Did we bring social work in to talk to the family? Yep. Wow, you've done a good job. I mean, I would, you know, social work to come in and talk to the family and try to explain to them and also maybe try to get some depends donated, you know, some of the, I don't know about there, but here the hospices end up with a whole lot of depends donated to them after somebody has died, and we can use those for clients that we're trying to talk into exactly what you're talking about is using them and not having to pay for them. It sounds like you've done absolutely everything you can, and Jimmo isn't going to solve every case that there is as far as maintenance goes, but um, those are the cases that it, we really need to cage conference back at our agencies about and everybody put their heads together and, and even with the um, assisted living staff. And if you can't come up with it at that point, unfortunately, you're going to have to do what we all hate doing, which is wait for something worse to happen. You know, she's going to fall and break her hip, you well, know, and then you're going to end up in there again. But um, I wish I had a magic answer for that one, but that's that's one of those cases that we all sort of go to bed at night thinking, Jesus, what, uh, what am I missing? I guess my question is, is not, I'm glad you confirmed that we've been doing a good job, but it, is that a case where you discharge the person because they're quote unquote non-compliant with suggestions, with recommendations, and just let the inevitable happen? Or is that a case where you continually go in and, and you know, periodically reassess the situation, see if she has declined, see if there are signs and symptoms of a UTI popping up before she falls, you know, that type of thing, absolutely. I guess is my, my question. Yeah, absolutely, to the extent that you can figure out how to do that. I mean, one of the things that you said that I would respond to is that, especially if there is any, any, any level of cognitive impairment, is she really non-compliant? That non-compliant kind of concerns me is that when we talk about patients being non-compliant, if you, one of the things that I was taught is, is bring everybody and their uncle in, even if, it, if it's a case like this and a, or a case where you feel like the patient is not safe at home because the family won't get rid of the stove and she keeps leaving it on, bring the fire department in. Bring everybody in to look at it and look at the case and see what are we missing here? What could we be doing differently? Because this is a frequent flyer at the hospital. She's costing huge amounts of Medicare dollars to be going in and out of the hospital with urinary tract infections all the time. And wait till you see the bill when she ends up breaking her hip from a fall. So bring everybody in and find somebody else that you can conference with on this case and see what you can do. And at that point, do you discharge her? Well, I wouldn't discharge her personally, but I'm not afraid to go to appeal either. I wouldn't discharge her. I would keep documenting the fact that this is a frequent flyer with urinary tract infections and frequent falls, and I'm going in to assess and to teach the best I can and even just keep teaching the same thing. And then if you end up going to appeal, I mean, I, I again, I'm not afraid to go to appeal with a case like that. So, so Sandy, Sandy it, would, it would appear to me that in that kind of situation, the real question is, what's the doctor saying? Right, because the question is, what's what's the doctor willing to put into the plan, in terms of um, the, the 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 home health agency continuing to go in and supervise, and then related to that is, what is is there a different kind of standard regarding what you define as non-compliant if the person's got dementia? I mean, is it arguable if the person's got dementia, she almost has not got the competence to become non-compliant? that you, you almost need to be trying to go in anyway to try to understand where she is um, because, she, she, because, she, because she doesn't have the competence to tell you not to. I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking about it as you're talking about that. I'm, you know, the, I, yeah, I think that, I think that in, a, in, a, in an appeal, if the family appeals, they don't want you to leave because the families never want us to leave. I mean, if the, if the family appeals and you're talking, and there's a dementia diagnosis and you're talking about noncompliance, 
I've seen I've seen those appeals go on the sides of the family that, you know, how can you be saying this patient's non compliant when she's not able to be compliant? She's got dementia. You know, so you've got to be careful about that on that side as well.